Second chapter of Revelation, the 8th through the 11 verses. We're now speaking to the church at Smyrna. It reads, To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions. I know your sickness, Charlene. I know your pain, Charlene. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid, Charlene. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, <clears throat> the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful, even to the point of death. And I will give you the crown of life. Verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let us pray. <clears throat> Most gracious God. Our Father, God, we are so grateful right now. You move how you move, God, and we can't tell you what to do. God, that prayer for your daughter, your soldier, your servant, Charlene Payne, needed to be had. You know how she's been operating since she heard about the test. And what could be one way or another. But God, victory has been claimed. And healing has been set forth. And now, God, we come with the word that you have ordained for this place. For this time and for this, your people. A base Bernard, God. And exalt the Holy Spirit. Use me, Lord, as a vessel. Take all of me for your glory. Let the words of my mouth, God, and the meditation of my heart to be acceptable in thy sight. O oh, Lord, my Redeemer, I pray. Amen. Amen. To the church at Smyrna. We could say to the church at San Road to the church at Westwood, to the church at Newark, to the church at East Orange, to the church at Patterson, to the church at Emerson, to the church at Brooklyn, to the church at Harlem. This word is speaking to us. <clears throat> last week, we, last, the previous two weeks, we talked about Jesus' message to the church at Ephesus. And if you remember, remember Ephesus, they did everything right for the kingdom of God. They did it all correctly. But they lacked one thing. They lacked love. People couldn't tell who they were doing it for. Were they doing it for God or were they doing it for self? In each of the seven churches, we will find certain things that we will look for in each of the seven churches. The first thing we will look for, who is the letter written to? The recipient. Last week, the last previous two weeks in Ephesus, we found that the recipient was to the minister or to the pastor of the church. <clears throat> the second thing that we will look for is the author. 
We will find that in each of these seven letters to the churches, the author will be the same, the Apostle John. At this time, John has been exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Why was he exiled? Why did they punish John? All because John was preaching the gospel. There's a speaker in each of these seven churches that's dictating the words to John and the speaker happened to be our Lord and Savior, risen Savior in a glorified body, Jesus Christ. And then we will find the location of each church. It was the church at Ephesus, so Ephesus was the location. This is the church at Smyrna, so Smyrna is the location. We'll go for five more churches in different locations. Each letter has a, condom, a commendation. There was five commendations for the church at Ephesus. We will find the commendation at the church for the church at Smyrna. And then with every commendation comes a condemnation. And we knew that with Ephesus, the condemnation was that you left your first love. You, they left their first love. And we will see what condemnation Jesus have for the church at Smyrna. And then the final thing, <clears throat> after the condemnation, Jesus never leave you. In a sea of despair. Jesus never leave you in a punishment. He always give you a way out. He gives you a promise. And with Ephesus. We saw that the promise was to the overcomers. Shirley you're an overcomer. You're an overcomer. And so now. The church at Smyrna. This church at Smyrna sits about 40 miles north and slightly northwest of the city of Ephesus. And verses 8 and 9 is what we will cover today. And verse 10 and 11, God willing, will be covered on next week. We don't want to rush through these things. There's some serious nuggets God is trying to give us through these letters to the churches. We understand that throughout history. That the church is come, that we understand our history that there come times that the church is called upon to suffer terrible persecution. This was definitely true of the church at Smyrna. The church of Smyrna was under heavy attack from both the community and the city officials. And verse 10 will inform us that there was even more persecution and suffering to come. But we will find out that the church at Smyrna, <clears throat> despite the persecution and suffering, was faithful to Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ's mission. The church was standing for truth against all attacks. It was a church in which there was nothing wrong. That is, it was nothing of major significance. Therefore, Smyrna was one of the few churches that Christ did not have to warn. Through all circumstances, no matter the trials or no matter the temptations, it is the picture of a church that loves the Lord enough to stand up for him even when the community surrounding them attacks is witness. <clears throat> As we discussed regarding the church at Ephesus, we talked about the fine five main areas we will need to point out in each of these. The recipients, the author, the location, the commendation, the common condemnation, and the promise. For the recipients, is found right in verse um, number eight. Right at the beginning at verse number eight, and it reads thusly, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right. To the angel of the church. We found out in, in two weeks ago as we started to talk about Ephesus that the angel of the church it means to the minister or to the pastor of the church. <clears throat> and that Jesus is dictating these words. 
We now know that when they, we go to a church and we hear somebody say to the angel of the church, they're meaning to the pastor of that local church. Then we find the word for the author. And we know that it's the apostle John. That is for each of the seven letters. The location we know as in verse eight, it says to the church in Smyrna. The commendation is found in verse number nine. Verse number nine says this. These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Along with the condemnation we find counsel that is in verse number 10. And also we find the promise is found in the last portion of verse number 10 and in verse number 11. <clears throat> verse number 8, to the angel, to the minister, to the pastor of the church. We understand what that means. And once again, I just want to stress the fact. Don't want to be a pastor. It's a heavy load. It's a heavy load. Attacks come at you from every angle. It's a heavy load. It's a heavy load because no, if the church is doing good, you're criticized. The church is doing bad, you're criticized even more. You're talked about no matter what. It's a heavy load. But I thank God that God maintains me. To be able to shoulder such a heavy load. Because he spoke to me this week and said, don't sweat this stuff. I got you. Don't sweat the people's faces when they turn their lips up. When you preach. I got you, Glee. I caught you here. Your vote, Mount Zion, was the process. Don't get it twisted. I just didn't come here to Westwood. God sent me here. Don't ever get it twisted. Because the day you get it twisted as if you've done something, God will come. And you'll have to answer. Don't get it twisted. This is God's doing. And it's marvelous in his sight. Don't, this, this is a heavy load. It's a heavy load that Karen can't help me with. It's a heavy load that tears on my pillow Karen can't wipe. It's a heavy load that when I'm praying for each and every one of the people in Mount Zion, attacks come to my body. Because the enemy don't want me to pray for you. It's a heavy load that you're talked about when you're doing good. When you're doing God's will, you're talked about. So I just tell the enemy... You can't touch me because God's got me all covered. So talk about me as much as you please. I don't care who you are. The more you talk, I'm praying for you. Because you're not attacking me, but you're attacking him. Because if it was up to Bernard, I would be in Harlem. No matter of fact, I would have been down south if it was up to me. But God's saying, no, your work is in Bergen County. Yes. And he's made it clear when we had the repass on the anniversary <coughs> at the community center. Brother David Smith, as he was leaving, I shook his hand. And he said, Pastor, you'll be here for another 20, 18, you'll be here for 20 years. So I said, that means 18 more anniversaries you have to be around. Because for that brother to say, that that was the Lord speaking through him. And so God has us here for the long haul. And I won't leave until God tells me to go. I won't move until God tells me to move. So come what may, whatever you send Satan, I'm ready for it. Because I'm covered by the grace of God. This church at Smyrna was a persecuted church. 
And it means that the minister or the pastor is to take the lead and stand in fast against the persecution of the church. Heavy load, but blessed at the same time. No matter what the circumstances is, the minister, the pastor, is to stand for Jesus Christ and to lead the people to stand for Christ. You must lead by example. Parents, that's what you are to do with your children. You can't tell your kids don't drink and you're getting drunk every night. You can't tell your sons you don't hit women and then you beat their mother. You can't tell your daughter, don't sleep around, and then you're sleeping around on the husband. We must lead by example. So as a pastor, I must lead by example. No matter the circumstances, the minister, the pastor, is not to buckle under the pressure and to deny Jesus Christ. They are to lead the people not to buckle under pressure, and to deny Jesus Christ. We must lead by example. No matter how severe the persecution may be, the minister, the pastor of the church, is to lead the people placed under their care to hold up the blood-stained banner of Christ high. Even if it means death, the minister, the pastor, must lead the people of God to do what Christ says to do. The song says we are soldiers in the army. We have to fight, although we have to cry. We've got to hold up the bloodstained banner, and we've got to hold it up until we die. The minister, the pastor, must be willing to give their own life for the protection of God's people and for the cause of Christ. If you're willing to do that, we can change places right now. But I know he told me that my life is required if I mess this up. And if you think I'm going to hell for any one of you, as much as I love you, that ain't happening. That is not happening. There are three facts we need to understand or realize about Smyrna. First, the word Smyrna means bitter. It received its name from the product, the product myrrh, that which was one of his main commercial products that was sold and manufactured in the city. Myrrh was a gum like resin taken from a shrub and was very bitter. In Psalm 45, verse 8, myrrh was used to make perfume. Mm -hmm. In Exodus 30, 23, it was used to make oil. Mm -hmm. In the Gospel of John, verse 19, I mean, chapter 19, verse 39, it was used to make embalming for the purpose of funerals. In Esther, the second chapter, verse 12, it tells us that myrrh was used for purification of women. Of women. And in Mark 15, 23, <clears throat> it was used for relieving and dulling pain. If somebody can get some myrrh for that pain, let me know where you get it from. <laughs> I'll get some. It was used to dull pain. We should understand at this point that this church, this church at Smyrna, was experiencing exactly what his name said, bitter sorrow, bitter affliction, and bitter persecution. The second thing was that Smyrna was a proud city. Smyrna was proud of his culture, proud of his beauty, proud of his commercial wealth, and proud of his social life. The citizens of this city called it the first city in Asia. <coughs> Everyone in Smyrna tried to climb the social ladder. 
and to go a step further than his neighbor. Everyone in Smyrna wanted to be first. Everyone wanted to have the highest seat. Everyone wanted to have the most recognition. But listen to the words that Jesus spoke at the ver beginning of verse 8. These are the words of him who is the first and the last. And in verse 10, he says, I will give you life as your victor's crown. Jesus came to say, I don't care how important you think you are. I'm the first Amen. and I'm the last. Amen. You ain't before me and you won't be behind me. I'm the first Amen. and the last. <clears throat> the third thing, the third fact to realize about Smyrna was that Smyrna, the city, was persecuting the church severely. There was a large number of Jews who were influential in the city's politics. Sound familiar? They did all they could to influ influence the city officials and to stand out the church, to stamp out the church. The Christian believer knew God personally and intimately. Therefore, they could now worship or participate in the festivals to the God, the lowercase g God, and the goddesses of their day. The Christian believer was marked. In some cases, they lost their jobs because you, they were a believer. And in all cases, social life within the city was severed or cut off. The Christian believers in Smyrna was mocked. They were abused. They were scorned and severely persecuted. Yeah. And when Jesus stated in verse 8 that he was the first and the last, it is a promise to the believers in Smyrna and it's a promise to us as believers today that he will be with them and he will be with us through all that we have to go through. Amen. From the very first to the very last. Christ is with them. Christ is with us because he himself has suffered not only a threat of death, but he suffered death itself. Christ knows what we're going through. We have mentioned <coughs> that the author of this letter is the Apostle John. The speaker is Jesus Christ himself. Christ has a very special message for the church that is it's suffering, trouble, and persecution. And his message is, in, is contained into two titles. The first title is that Christ says he's the first and the last. He is the one supreme authority and ruler over life. Amen. This description of Jesus is important. And it is drawn from the imagery contained in chapter 1, verse 17 and 18. Listen to the words of chapter 1, 17 and 18. When I saw him, <clears throat> I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said to not be afraid. I am the first and the last. Amen. I'm the living one, was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. The enemy, Mount Zion, may think that they hold authority over you in your life, but they do not. There are some who may claim to be the first and the last. They may claim to have the final word and the final authority, but they are deceived. There is only one first and last. Only one supreme authority, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God himself. This means that all persecutors of God's church and of God's people, <clears throat> all those who afflict and cause trouble for others, had better take heed. They shall be judged if they think that they can usurp the authority that God has given in his church into their own hands. 
There is only one human, there's only one authority over human lives and human actions, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are all to look to him. Any person or persons who causes troubles and persecutes other people shall face God's ultimate judgment. <clears throat> this also means that believers always have the presence of Christ with them. Through all their troubles and persecutions of life. Jesus Christ is the first and the last. He is always there. He never leaves us. He is there with the believer when the trouble first begins. He is there with the believer when the trouble is going on. And he is there with the believer when the trouble finally ends. Whatever you're going through, there's a start and there is an end. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, you're in the middle of what you're going through. Yes. But I've come to tell you, Kevin Sims, your end is on the horizon. Uh -huh. The hell that you're experiencing now uh -huh. is just for a temporary time frame. Yes. Keep looking to God. Keep, Keep trusting God. Keep. Trouble don't last. Always. Come on. It will come uh -huh. to an end. Thank you, God. The title, First and the Last, which is mentioned three times in the book of Isaiah, is connected with the title Alpha and Omega, yes. which happens to be the first and the last in the Greek alphabet. <coughs> we will also find Jesus referring to himself in chapter 22 of Revelation and verse 13, the following words, I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus Christ, and no man and no woman, but Jesus Christ is the first and the last. He spans all time. All the minutes and hours of time, his presence covers all the problems. His presence covers all the circumstances and troubles of human life. Jesus is always in charge of what happens to us. He controls the circumstances. He controls the struggles, no matter what happens. Therefore, he will, he has, he can, he must work things out for the believer. Yes. John, <coughs> the gospel of John, chapter number 8, verse 58, says these words. Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, mm -hmm. I am. Uh -huh. Before Abraham was, not this Abraham. Nah. Before Abraham was, uh -huh. I am. Yes. Romans 8.28 says, And we know <laughs> that all things, all things work together for good to them yes. that love the Lord, to them who are called according called. to his Come on. purpose. Yes. Romans 8, 35, 37 and th to 39 says, who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Nay, in all these things, we, me, you yes. are more than conquerors yes. through him that loved us. Yes. Then he says, for I am persuaded yes. that neither death Come on. nor life yes. nor angels Come on. nor principalities yes. nor powers uh -huh. nor things present uh -huh. nor things to come yes. nor, height, nor height nor death uh -huh. nor any other creature shall, shall be able to separate me shall be able to separate you yes. from the love of God Hallelujah. which is in Christ Jesus Hallelujah. our Lord you ought to be happy Hallelujah. that nobody, nobody nothing in this world uh -huh. can separate you from God's love yes. nothing in this world can stop God from loving you you ought to be happy Hallelujah. that you serve uh -huh. such a God, Thank you, God. secondly hmm. Secondly, Christ says, what he say? in the last of verse 8, 
He is the one who was dead and is alive again. Yes, Lord. Who here died and now are alive again? Come on. If you did, we will call Becca because you ought not be here. If you're dead and you're alive again, that means you are, you're Jesus because he's the only one that ever died and rose back to life. This word really means he became. Christ became dead. His death on the cross was only a passing phase. An episode that he had to go through. He experienced death. But death was only a passing thing for Jesus. He triumphed over it. Alive is a once and for all act. Once it's done, it's done. It is completed. It is finished. Jesus came to life again. He arose. Therefore, the message to the church at Smyrna and to us today, no matter what you experience, it is only a passing phase. Stop going crazy. Stop rolling on the ground. Stop running down the street crying. It's only a passing phase. Somebody's been sick and now you're healed. It was only a passing phase. Somebody was broke asking people for money. But now you got a house. You got two cars. You got clothes. It was only. Only. A passing phase. Stop going crazy, child of God. You serve a God that created everything. Do you really think he's going to let his children suffer like that? Because it's for his name's sake. It's only a passing phase. Even if death comes, death has already been conquered. Christ has personally been there. And triumph over pain and death. Therefore the believer shall live forever. Even if they are killed for the cause of Christ. John 3.16 says. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever. Whosoever. I'm so grateful that I'm part of the whosoever. That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. But have everlasting life. John 5, 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. Second Peter 2, 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. If you are a child of God, the day of judgment will not come for you. It is those that do not know God that God will judge because he has given everybody the same chance. He has given us all. We're no special people that we accepted Christ. We're just wise. He gave the same chance to those that won't accept him. Amen. But something happened in our lives. Yes. There was a shift somewhere. Yes. Uh-huh. That it said I'm better off with him. Than without him. Oh, yes. And so we live today for Christ. And Christ lives inside. Of us. Verse 9 indicates. The commendation. Jesus here is given a diagnosis. Of the healthiness. Or the unhealthiness. Of the church at Smyrna. He is letting them know in this verse that he is aware of their tribulations. He is aware of their suffering. The church is commended for four things. First, the church is commended because they bored up or they persevered under terrible tribulation. The Greek word for tribulation is the lispin. It means affliction. The pressure of crushing Affliction. Has anybody here ever suffered affliction in your life? 
Has anybody here ever suffered crushing affliction in your life that you did not think you could come out of it? That you thought this has to be the end? That you thought hell cannot be any worse than what I'm going through right now? But then something happened. You can look back at that affliction period and you can realize that it was just a passing phase. That I came out better than I went in that affliction. That I came out stronger than I went in. Affliction is not your friend. But it could be a mighty good support for you. Affliction, nobody wants to suffer. Nobody wants to go through tribulations. But Jesus told his disciples, in this life, you will have tribulations. He's letting them know, you will go through some stuff. He's letting them know, get ready, because it's coming. Can't tell you when, can't tell you how strong, but it's coming. But then he gave a blessed promise. Be of good cheer. Good cheer. Be encouraged. Uh-huh. Why? Because I have already, already. overcome the world. Thank you, God. Your afflictions will not kill you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Your tribulation will not kill you. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And afflictions and sufferings and tribulation is no respect of person. Uh-huh. Black, white, red, green, orange, purple, whatever color you are. <laughs> You will suffer. They have no age favoritism. If you're young, if he wants to take you out, he'll do some stuff. It doesn't matter the age. The devil don't like or love any of us. He hates us all. So he'll do what he has to do. The believers was holding up under her tax and refusing to deny Christ. They were faithful to Christ, despite all the ridicule, all the mockery, all the abuse, all the cursing, the loss of property, possible imprisonment, and possible death. They stood up to all the negative charges and attacks against them and never denied Christ. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verses 17 and 18 says, but beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. Matthew 24, 9 says, then shall they deliver up to be afflicted and shall kill you and ye shall be hated. On of all nations for my name sake. John 15, 20, 21 says, <clears throat> remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Amen. If they have persecuted me, this is Jesus talking. They will also persecute you. Yes. If they have kept my saying, <clears throat> they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. Secondly, the church bore up or was or persevered under poverty. The idea here is that of having nothing and being destitute and beggarly. Apparently, many of the individuals that were the believers and the families were being forced out of their jobs and having their property confiscated as lawbreakers, all because they serve Christ. Apparently, this is how it happened. The Roman government instituted a law that said that the state had to be the first loyalty of the citizens. Come here, Nebuchadnezzar. To show that loyalty, the citizen had to proclaim their loyalty once a year. Three Hebrew boys. You got to you got to connect the dots. This is this they did by going before the local government officials and making the following statement. Caesar is Lord. 
Caesar is Lord. Caesar is Lord. A true believer and follower of Christ could not do this. For there is only one Lord, one God, and his name is not Caesar. It is the Lord Jesus Christ. But who is your Caesar? Who have you put before God? What have you put before God? Is it your car? He'll take it. Is it your spouse? He'll take them. Is it your children? He'll take them. Is it your job? You'll lose it. Don't put nothing before God. Don't put no one before God. God said, thou shalt not have no other gods before me. That's a commandment. And if I'm not wrong, it's the first commandment. He said, my glory, I will share with no one. There's no room on God's throne for anybody but him. Amen. There's no room. We can't sit on his lap on that throne. Amen. There's no room. Jesus is not even on God's throne. He's sitting at the right hand. There's no room for no one else on God's throne. Be careful. Be careful who you put in front of God and what you put. He's a jealous God, but he loves you. But he's a jealous God. They had to say Caesar is Lord. This was the reason the church was being attacked and persecuted so severely and suffering so much. They would not under no circumstances declare their loyalty to another man. Their loyalty was to Jesus Christ and to Jesus Christ alone. This suffering is also found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 32 to 34. Listen to these words out of Hebrew. <clears throat> Remember those earlier days after you have received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times you stood side by side with those who were so treated you suffered along with those in prison and joyfully, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. Your home that you pay your mortgage on, that you pay your property taxes on is not your home. This earth, children of God, is not your home. We are aliens on this earth. We're pilgrims passing through. Our home is in heaven. Stop getting so caught up in stuff. Stop getting caught up in stuff because he will remove it. The church was spiritually wealthy. The church was outwardly poor. But inwardly they were rich towards the Lord and his mission. They were faithful to the Lord. They loved the Lord and each other even when they opposed each other. They loved the Lord they, and each other when they, even when they opposed each other. They ministered to all in need. They studied and taught the scriptures and they lived righteous and holy lives. Where do you fall in those four categories? Mount Zion. And because of their faithfulness, they were filled with the fullness of God's presence. God poured out upon them the riches of his grace and the fruit of his spirit as they walked day by day, ministering to folks that are unsaved. They were filled with love. They were filled with joy. They were filled with peace. They were filled with long suffering. They were filled with gentleness. They were filled with goodness. They were filled with faith. They were filled with meekness. They were filled with self-control. And if you didn't get it, 
I just read off the fruits of the Spirit. Nope, let me correct that. I just read off the fruit of the Spirit. It's not plural. One fruit. Nine particles. One fruit. The fruit of the Spirit out of Galatians 5. God flooded them and carried them through all their trials. He strengthened and settled them empowered and assured them with his presence, the very presence of God himself. And finally, the church bore up or persevered under all kinds of slander. The slander came especially from the Jews of the city. There was a large community of Jews in Smyrna. We know this from historians that they were very prosperous and made large gifts to the arts and to the culture development of the city. Some things just never change. As a result, these Jews were influential with the city officials and local Roman government. As stated, it was the Jews who were stirring up so much trouble against the church. Look at how they did this. They slandered this church. The Jews used their tongues to ridicule the church, to accuse the church, to talk about the church, to mock, backbite, tear down, lie on, criticize, discriminate against, spread rumors about, murmur against, and divide the church. But I've come to tell you, we don't need Jews to do that. We're doing that to ourselves. Right in the church. But know what Christ says about these slandering Jews. Notice the indictment Jesus Christ uses. I know about the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not. But are a synagogue of Satan. (coughs) A synagogue of Satan. But what exactly does that mean? The Jews were God's appointed people during the Old Testament period of history. Before Christ came into the world. They were the people whom God had raised up to be his witnesses upon the earth. But many of them had failed to believe and follow God. In fact, they had even killed God's only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Jews in Smyrna professed to be Jews, to be followers of God, but they were not. They were persecuting the real followers of God. Those who believed and worshiped the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of God himself. Therefore, they were not worshipers of God, not of the true and living God. On the contrary, they were worshipers of Satan. Romans second chapter verses 28 to 29 says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly and circumcision is a matter of the heart. By the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So Jesus knew, knows the reality of those who are suffering and those that is behind the suffering. So Mount Zion, October 31st, 2021, where do you stand? We are either an assembly of God, of the true and living God, or we are, we are of the synagogue of Satan. Oh There's no middle road. Amen. Either you're going to serve God, the true and living God, the way he tells you to. Yes. Or you serve Satan. Oh no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Nothing in the middle. No middle oh, Jesus. You need to decide, Mount Zion, what you're going to do. Jesus. He's asking the question. We are here to make disciples. When was the last time you shared God with somebody? 
When was the last time you fed a hungry person? I don't think they're really hungry. That's not for you to decide. <laughs> I don't think they really is of need. That's not for you to decide. What if God said, I don't really think he wants to wake up this morning? That's not for you to decide. We are to make disciples. I told you about the young lady, Nikki, that called. This is making a disciple. You've got to do it God's way. Not how you want it to work. God deserves faithful followers. How can we be more dedicated to our jobs than we are to God? Our job says you are to be here at 8 o'clock. We're walking in at 745. But when it comes time for church, we lollygag in at 1015, 1030. You're not hurting the pastor. You're telling God, I'll get here when I get here. (laughs) Who are you really? Who do you really think you are? God is the one that has blessed us with the job. How can we be more dedicated to our families than to God? He's the one that's blessed us with the family. Where do you stand today as a church and as individuals? Are you a true worshiper in the assembly of God or are you a worshiper in the synagogue of Satan? You really need to decide. Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. It says this day, not tomorrow, Uh not next week. This day, Uh this is all you got right now. Make your choice and stop playing this dangerous game with God. Make your decision as if your life depends on it. Because guess what? It does. You may walk out of here and drop dead. Where will you go? One o'clock is not promised to you. 1230 is not promised to you. Karen just had a birthday yesterday. She turned 25 years old. But it was not a promise. 1159 Friday. The Lord could have called her home. Choose ye this day whom you whom ye will serve. God has given us a warning, Mount Zion. We must heed his warnings. And he given us the warning because he loves us. If he didn't love us, he wouldn't warn us. Because the word says, He will come like a thief in the night. And you will never know when a thief is coming. But God has given you a warning. To get right with God, do it now. The song says, get right with God, he will show you how. Then it goes on to say, down at the cross, where he shed his blood. Then it says, get right with God. Get right. Get right. With God. When I came to Mount Zion. God said. I don't want to ever hear. From that pulpit. A flowery message. I don't want to ever hear. From that pulpit. A sugar coating message. He said they've had enough of that. He said give them the word. Raw. And if it hurt, it hurts. If it cuts, it cuts. Because the cut is only going to help you. The hurt is only going to help you. And if I give a sugary message, I've got to answer to that. 
And I've got to answer not to anybody here, but to God. And if I got to answer for God, I want to make sure I hear, well done. Thou good and faithful service. You've been faithful in a few things. And I want him to tell me, come on up. And I will make you master over many. Choose you this day, Mount Zion. He deserves better than what we've been given.